practices for sourcing, identifying, and successfully hiring full, full-time technical talent. She offers services through the Entrepreneurs in Residence program, and she hosts annual training events and workshops throughout the year, such as this one. Um, her consulting services include technical recruiting advice and strategy suggestions. Um, in the past couple, in the past month, she's offered, um, she did a presentation on just kind of an update on what's going on in the job market. And today's presentation, she is focusing specifically on, um, uh, on job search strategies. So she'll cover kind of what's going on in the marketplace as well as uh, providing a whole bunch of resources available and um, you know, what you can be doing during this time if you are um, on that job hunt. I'm also going to put into the chat box um, a place that you can go to request assistance from Sophie. So um, that is a resource that is available through Enterprise Works. Um, and um, as a reminder, we are asking that everybody stay muted, but during the presentation, if you'd like, you can um, put a question into the chat box and we will get that answered for you. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Sophie to go ahead and get started. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I will start sharing my screen and just jump right in. Um, well, thank you for the, thank you for the introduction. And I, I have been recruiting for um, about seven years now around the U.S. Um, for Fortune 500 companies, startups, um, and then also a lot of time in Champaign-Urbana. I grew up in Champaign-Urbana, went to school, high school, and then also the University of Illinois. So Champaign-Urbana is definitely a focus here, but also um, looking at what's going on from a recruiting and hiring perspective nationally. All right. <clears throat> so this presentation is two parts. Um, one is the actual PowerPoint, and then one is also a Google Doc that any of you can download just in order to have a full scope of just links that you can go to to get your job search started or continued or, or changing strategies up a little bit. So here, um, I'm as, I hope you can all see my screen. If someone can let me know if, if it's not, that'd be great. It is not up yet. It is not up, okay. Okay, one moment. There we go. Okay. And I just put the link to the Google Doc into the chat window. Thank you. All right, so finding a job during, during COVID. Um, this has been a really interesting presentation to overall put together. And, um, and I hope that you all find a lot of this um, useful. A lot of it will be job search strategies that work at any time, but then a lot of it is geared towards what specifically we're seeing right now with everything going virtual and the incredible amount of change that we're seeing in various different industries and companies that have been impacted by the stay-at-home orders and, and other legislation. So what we'll be covering today, the current job market, uh, virtual job searching strategies and your resume and resources that you can use to tell your story and present yourself effectively. Um, the Google Doc, which Jenny has already put into the Zoom link, is also linked here. And then one thing that I think is incredibly helpful as a national resource is a resource called Silver Lining. And I just wanted to point that out here so that you all can join it. I don't, I'm not a part of it in any way other than just being a participant, but it's an incredible resource that lists different industries and companies that are hiring all over the country and, um, and has a lot of free resources for resume reviews, mock resume or mock interviews. Um, and so I just encourage you to really leverage that free resource if, if you just do one thing from today. So the good news, I think it's easy to focus on a lot of what's going on um, in terms of the, we've all been impacted and sometimes very negatively, but there are some silver linings as the job posting site indicates. Um, one of them being that given that there's a need to work from home, 
we have greater access overall to jobs that you can now apply to that would have been location specific before that are now accessible from anybody in the nation. Uh, many courses and certifications are discounted and free and that's all linked in the Google Doc. There's, um, there's hundreds of, of courses that you can now do for free. Um, every week we get new information. So as this COVID situation happened very quickly, it's also um, increasing pretty quickly too, as you'll see in some, some graphs coming up. And then everything is, everyone is experiencing the same thing. So don't be afraid to ask for help. If you've been laid off, um, obviously this is a situation that's, that's very understandable and, um, and people are, are by and large extremely generous with their time. So in terms of the current job posting trend, when I did my first presentation, this looked a lot different. What we were seeing was the steep decline going into April, right after the stay at home orders. But we're actually seeing a pretty drastic, at this point, increase in job posting. So this is nationally with Indeed. And after May, as we're seeing counties reopen, and various different businesses being allowed to open doors in some ways, we're seeing that companies are again increasing their hiring efforts or bouncing back, which is awesome news because we didn't know exactly how this was going to play out or how quickly the national economy would begin to hire again. So, there is a shift overall in terms of where the power lies and this impacts your overall job searching strategy. So prior to COVID, the power was definitely with the talent because there were so many companies hiring and not very much talent based off of unemployment numbers. That power has shifted. We don't know if it will be a temporary shift or if it will be something longer lasting, but that does change the overall talent strategy. So now the talent is on the company side because there's just overall greater supply of talent on the market and overall less companies that are hiring as aggressively as they were beginning of the year. So this just changes the overall strategy in terms of talent needing to be more creative, more proactive and more prepared. In terms of national industry impact, what's, um, what I think is most important to look at here is the least impacted, and this is from LinkedIn, their hiring data for, at a national perspective. And so you'll see that hardware, computer hardware and computer networking companies are the, actually the only industry that had a net increase for month over month for April in terms of hiring. So one strategy that you could take here, now that we have a little bit of information on what industries are actually hiring or adding is create a list. Um, you can do that through Crunchbase or any other research tool that you use to look at various different companies and then start to dig into that in terms of who might be hiring and what roles they're hiring for. Um, there's a caveat here that every list is compiled a, a little bit differently depending on where you're looking, whether you're looking at LinkedIn or you're looking at Indeed or, or Crunchbase for that matter. And um, always use your own observation as well. You can see what's going on around you and that can give you a competitive leg on making your own list and doing your own research in terms of finding companies that um, that are off the beaten path a bit, but still doing well given um, the economic situation. So cities impacted, this will be most important to look at for potentially new graduates. So if you're considering relocating or were going to relocate and you're looking for cities or companies to specifically target, these lists are helpful in order to understand where you might be able to go um, post the post the travel restrictions and such being lifted and then um, and then 
digging into areas of, of where it may not be best to relocate. So this would be an example of definitely research to look into deeper if you're specifically a maybe a recent graduate not from the Champaign-Urbana area or um, or relocating back home. And now in terms of Champaign-Urbana specifically, um, I do have lists of who's hiring. There's a plethora of companies that are hiring in Champaign-Urbana and we actually have a, a, a relatively robust economy comparatively to what's going on in the overall nation. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit later in the, in the Google Doc. Um, so who's hiring? The organizations or the categories here in green are the ones that actually added jobs during the past 60 days or so, um, which is important to realize when companies are either laying off, freezing, or simply um, just backfilling past positions. These are the categories, according to NPR, that are actually um, adding, actively adding new positions. A lot of these are intuitive in terms of online learning and shipping and delivery. I think we all know at this point that Amazon is hiring. Um, but there's also companies that don't show up on your go-to who's hiring list, if you were to just type that into Google. Um, and two examples of that is Peloton. So that is um, at-home workout solution. And then Chewy, which is a delivery solution for um, pet supplies. This is essentially a list of companies that are actively hiring and then the ones in green are the ones who are actually increasing their headcount at a time when many companies are freezing or laying off. Um, but it's also important to not go by the run of the mill lists where an example of companies that are hiring that aren't on the general top 10, top 11 lists. Peloton is an example of that, a virtual home workout solution. And then Chewy, which is a direct to delivery for pet supplies or direct to home delivery for pet supplies. So um, definitely use your own observation skills and look outside the run of the mill in terms of who's hiring when you're driving down the street, where's busy, what are you using online, um, and less reliance on the Forbes overall top 10 list of who's hiring. Uh, okay, so we'll dig into resumes, researching and contacting and how that has changed specifically for a, a virtual job searching strategy. So over the past two years, resumes have changed quite a bit in terms of um, how they are processed on the company side. There's something called an applicant tracking system, often called an ATS. Um, which is a recruiter's best friend in terms of saving the recruiter a lot of time in order to process resumes. But what it doesn't do is really help the candidate very much if your resume isn't optimized for an ATS. And this is probably the most important part of this presentation in terms of creating your resume in a way that it will actually be seen. So if you're applying to a larger company, they are getting 75 applications or 75,000 applications every week. Um, not, a recruiter is not going to look over every single one of those resumes. They will process it through an algorithm that will look for specific keywords that match. They're looking for, do you actually have the years of experience that the job description is asking for? Um, do you actually have the skill set? Uh, and so how, how do they go about figuring that out is what, we'll, is what we'll look at and how to create your resume in a way that it won't get filtered out in terms of being one of those 75% of resumes that won't be seen by a recruiter or a hiring manager, even if you do have the qualifications. So one example of this, I was working for a... Um, a large company, a, a large Fortune 500 company earlier in the year, I actually had someone at the on-site interview stage. Therefore, they were more than qualified for the position and actually ended up getting the job. However, when we asked them to apply to the companies, um, just 
applicant tracking system apply online with their resume, they actually received an automatic rejection email because their resume didn't actually match how they had structured the applicant tracking system to filter out resumes. So this person submitted their application. They were already in the on-site interview phase and they did get the job, but they were immediately sent a rejection email based on where they put, or based on how they structured their actual resume. So that's an example of someone that was highly qualified and actually got the job, but they would have never been seen if they had gone to applying for the job, the traditional route of, um, of simply applying. So this is arguably the biggest deterrent right now if you're applying to a larger company. It's important to note, not all companies use an applicant tracking system like this. It's by and large, um, very large companies that are dealing with a, that are dealing with just a high volume of applicants on a, on a very regular basis. And top resume here is a fantastic resource to use. A lot of this um, information is from them and it's a fantastic resource to use in terms of how to craft your resume. So here are some examples of risky resumes. If you have your contact information, specifically in the header or the footer or any information for that matter, it's harder to get parsed out. So you don't want to put your contact information there, leave it at the top center middle where you would expect it. Um, fancy resumes, they, they look good and they may be helpful for standing out or, um, or differentiating yourself. However, sometimes the templates can get very scrambled going through an ATS. Um, many times when I've received resumes through an ATS, I'll email the person back and say, I'm sorry, the formatting got super scrambled. Can you please just email me a copy of your resume or in a different format? Because you can tell that it just gets very distorted if it's not your standard template. Um, the best way to stand out is to have extremely good content, a very clean resume with no errors, and um, great examples and quantifiable results rather than colors or pictures or um, or focusing on a template that's different versus just content and writing that's better. Um, and then on the next slide we have specific examples. So um, the keywords we'll go over in detail but this is incredibly important in getting past algorithms if you are applying to larger companies. And then in terms of file types, so applicant tracking systems, the best is to, to use is a dot doc. So your word file or dot docs. Um, PDFs are perfect for emailing to a colleague or specific manager, but not when applying specifically um, through somebody's applicant tracking system. Okay, so here's some, uh, just a checklist. Your resume should be tailored to the role. It's pretty obvious when a resume is um, your master template. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a master resume, but you need to make sure that is tailored to the specific role. And you do that um, with using, with specifically using the job description and doing really good research on not only the, co the company, but the role and then the recent events. Um, you'll want to use a standard professional template. So instead of, again, one of the fancy ones, use one that looks professional and then focus on having extremely good examples of your work. And then you'll want to use one of these formats. Don't put anything in the header or the footer, maybe except for a page number, keeping your resume to one or two pages. And then keywords. So there's a difference between buzzwords and, key and keywords. A keyword is something that you're taking from the job that you're applying to. So if the job description specifically says that they are looking for someone who is scrum certified and you are scrum certified use that word um, don't use the synonym of it um, 
use that word and put the specific and put it under your actual experience where you used it. Um, stray away from words that are more generic. So I'm self-motivated, I'm a team player, I'm a hard worker, I'm goal-oriented, I'm process-driven. These are examples of um, more fillers that don't mean anything out of context. And if you don't have numbers associated with them, they, um, they get glossed over pretty quickly. I think the average recruiter spends maybe 30 seconds when going through a stack of resumes. And those words do not stand out on a resume um, because they are generic. Um, and key words are specific to the job, the industry, or the company, and come with a quantifiable example. So an example here um, is just good old Michael Scott. Um, Michael Scott manages a branch of a paper company is a far different sentence from Michael Scott manages a team of 12 salesmen and a five person warehouse, which averages 3 million in USD in sales per quarter. Um, that's slightly a horrible sentence that I wrote. However, um, it's an example of being vague versus being specific and showing that, um, showing that you pay attention to the numbers in your role and it makes it also seem more truthful when you have um, when you have all of the numbers there of, of what happened in in your past experience which is which is incredibly important okay so finding the right keywords um, so say you're looking for the role of a project manager or you're applying to project management roles you would take three different job descriptions. You could do it with one, but you could do it um, with one to three or more. You copy and paste the job descriptions of a project manager into um, like a word cloud generator. So a very popular version of that is called Wordle. And so copy and paste all of the text into, into Wordle. You'll, you don't need to include um, things the apply here or about the company, but you'll insert the job description information and then you'll get a list of the most commonly or the most frequently used words. And those are the words that you then make sure are part of your, your resume. Um, now with an ATS, what's important to know is that is how an ATS calculates your years of experience. So let's say I have Python under my past job that I was at for three years. The ATS will see Python underneath that job that I listed as three years and it'll assume I have three years of Python experience. If I have a summary of qualifications section on my resume, the ATS will automatically assume that that's six months. I don't know why, and all, um, all ATSs are slightly different, but for a summary of qualifications section, I will assume that it's around six months of experience. So when you add, if you have a summary of qualifications or an objective on your resume, then you can, um, you can put it in both spots, or I would recommend putting it in both spots, those keywords, so that you're counted appropriately. In the example that I gave with the um, with the client I was working for, where he was actually offered the job but was sent a rejection email from the applicant tracking system, it was because of this that they didn't think that he had the appropriate years of experience given how he structured um, having specifically Amazon Web Services experience and where he put that um, specifically on his resume. So this is actually really new and really important to, to look at when you're applying. Um, there's a variety of different applicant tracking systems that companies use, and, um, and you can look into the specific ones if you're interested. And again, Top Resume actually has, a, um, has like a mock generator. You can input your resume and you can see how it would be read by a common ATS. And then these are some free services. So 
these some of this I actually pulled from uh, from Silver Linings, which is just a fantastic resource. Um, but I highly recommend doing a resume or editing service. They will go through and find a lot of information on your resume that either could be added or um, spelling errors or um, or formatting idiosyncrasies that are important to catch. Uh, recruiters, if they, they're looking again for anything to disqualify someone in some ways because they have so many resumes to get through in a short period of time. And so if you have spelling errors on your resume, it's an easy way for that person to get through their job a little bit quicker. And so you really wanna make sure that it's an airtight resume from that point of view and that 50 to $250 can have a huge ROI if you are getting past um, more resume screens. You can also do um, profile optimizations on LinkedIn. There's absolutely services for that. I'm happy to recommend some and then, um, and LinkedIn has them themselves. And then here's the link for running your resume through an ATS with a warning that if you do this, you'll get contacted by, I'm sure, their sales team. But I do know people that have used it and they, they have a, um, a positive experience. My sister is currently job searching and she, she recently used it and had a very positive experience. And I don't own any stock in that company, nor do I work for them. Um, and then mock interviews. It's incredible how helpful it can be just to practice your, your responses to very common questions. Why do you want this job? Um, why are you interested in this company? Why are you looking for a job? Even the very easy ones, um, of course, it's super, the easiest route is to tell the truth, um, but making sure that you're crafting your story in a way that's concise and accurate and applicable takes a take some work okay so researching in summary of some of this it's a, it's incredibly important to do the upfront research so that you're crafting your keywords correctly so you get past the first round screens um, so that you're applying to applicable positions you need to look at how long a position has been posted if it was posted prior to the stay at home orders, it's possible that the company just didn't take it down or, um, or things are changing. And so you'll focus on, you'll want to focus on jobs that have been posted in the last 30 days. An average job is open for 40 days. And so that's a, a good way to look at where you can prioritize your time most effectively. Um, research also helps you contact people most appropriately in the company in order to follow up on your application, and I, I'll also go into that. And then preparing for the interview overall. You have to have good questions when you're going into the interview. You need to know about the company. Given where the power is at between the companies and the talent, it's not acceptable to not have good questions. Even if you've done a heck of a lot of research, Having good questions shows, one, that you know how to research, you know about the company, you're interested, um, and that you've dug deeper and it helps to differentiate yourself. Okay, so again on the Google Doc, there's a list, there's, there's a few lists to get you started there, nationally and specific to Champaign-Urbana. Um, Create your list of dream companies that you can start to have a regular cadence of checkups on, and you can create Google alerts on those companies, Crunchbase alerts, TechCrunch alerts, LinkedIn alerts, so that you get the most up-to-date information, and you can be actively following them. And this will help you now, but also in a year from now or two years from now, um, and as throughout your entire career, if there's certain companies that you want to keep your eye on. And then, um, and then staying up to date, of course, with, um, with Silver Linings and Hacker News. Um, there's a template here that I use 
a modified template that I would use in order to keep track of the point of contact, the best point of contact at a given company, um, when you contacted them, and the context of that. Uh, and not many people actually do that. So simply being organized and emailing with a, with a thoughtful follow-up can go a long way in differentiating yourself. So who should you be contacting at a given company? There's four different categories. So you can contact human resources or people operations. They're synonymous, people operations and human resources. It's just a more trendy way to say human resources. Um, talent acquisition is the same as a recruiter. And then what takes a little bit more effort in terms of your research is um, the hiring manager and individual contributors. <clears throat> so the first category is going to be the easiest people to find, human resource, or the first two. Uh, human resources and people operations, they typically have their emails on their LinkedIn. It's their job to process incoming candidates. And, um, and so they will, and they usually have their emails at least on the website. And they're appropriate people to follow up with and say, hi, I applied for this job a week ago. Um, I'm really interested, interested in your company because of X, Y, and Z. And here's another copy of my resume. Would you mind providing a status update of when, I'd, when it would be possible to hear back? Um, going with the hiring manager route takes more work, but it's more effective in some ways. So if you can find out who the hiring manager is for your role, through research on either LinkedIn, through your network, or the company website. That's a very effective way to bypass the application process as if that hiring manager sees your resume and knows that it would likely be a good fit for the team. They, um, they have the ability to simply ask the recruiting team to push you along in the process. And that's, that's a very effective um, can be a very effective method overall, um, mostly because the hiring managers are the ones that know most intimately what they are looking for for their teams. A recruiter takes the direction from the hiring manager of how to staff, help that hiring manager staff for their team. So the recruiter is, in many cases, one step removed. Lastly, it's individual contributors, and that's best to contact if you're looking for advice on what the company is like, what the team is like, uh, what the day-to-day -day and the role is like, and they also ha will have good influence in terms of internally on the team. Um, they are best to, they'll be harder to find in terms of locating a specific team, but likely have the most amount of time um, to spare in terms of in terms of helping out with candid information as well as likely get the least amount of emails out of um, out of the four categories on this list. Okay. So after applying, what should you do in order to stand out and, and get um, get a, at least a response? So you can email the recruiter or the hiring manager to let them know that you applied. Here's another copy of my resume. And if you could be so kind to um, let me know of the timeline of this position, that would be great. Um, and then finding emails. So on the Google Doc, there's a whole list of strategies on how to find anyone's email. Um, this is the tried and true, very simple way of looking at the company website, figuring out the email syntax, and then making sure that it's a real email. Um, and that's a link to the email checker to verify. Um, what is a very effective tool is email trackers. Um, almost everyone in sales and recruiting uses email tracking. And, um, and this is a a $12 tool that you could start using now to help yourself. And the best thing about it is just simply knowing if your email was ever opened. So sometimes you'll send an email to a hiring manager or recruiter, and you'll think, gosh, like I never got a response from that company. What jerks. <laughs> and, and maybe they are, but 
um, they maybe just are swamped and never even saw it. And so your follow-up to a email that was never read is going to be different than a follow-up to an email that was open six times. So this is literally a screenshot from my email. And you can see Luke and I have emailed back and forth three times. And I can see that he opened my last email six times. So he's not ignoring me. He got the information. He's just taking some time to think about it before he responds. Now, um, that is, that's a very, very helpful tool when thinking about um, how to ask for follow-up information and how, how often to ask for a status update, knowing if they saw your email or even not. Okay, so this is, this is on the company side and on the recruitment side. Don't tell me that you're able to be transparent or a great communicator, I want you to show me. And this is important for standing out given our new talent market where the power is currently in the, in the realm of the, of the companies. So instead of saying I'm a great communicator, you can show them with writing samples and blog posts. Um, I'm up to date on the tech industry. Here's a, here's a review I did on the latest technologies for recruitment tools. Um, and I've ranked them in terms of what I think is the most appropriate for your industry. Um, I'm passionate about Python. It's one thing to say, it's another thing to link to your GitHub that shows your most recent project that you did. Um, I'm, I'm a continuous learner. Um, I hear that so often. I think every person that tells me that, um, it, they think that they're sounding very unique. Um, and I believe them and I think that about myself. However, you have to be able to back that up, that you're a continuous learner. I love learning. Okay. Well, during shelter at home, I've taken these courses. Um, not only am I extremely curious, but I also have the dedication and determination to sit down and, um, and have the discipline to do these things at home. Um, and then here's some other examples of showing versus, versus telling that you're interested or that you have these specific qualities. And we're almost done here. Okay, so these are some common interview questions. You can also Google common interview questions. You can easily Google how to prepare for a remote interview, which is why I didn't include some of these things in here. There's a plethora of resources. Um, but why are you interested in our company and what are you looking for in your next career move? These are need to be unique to you. And, um, and the wrong answer is, I got laid off and I really just need a job. As true as that might be, um, and that I just need an income for my family, that's completely understandable but there's a, a better way to present your story. So by and large, most people fall into these three categories in terms of why you want to take a new job and what is motivating you. And so you can think about this structure when telling your own story, it's not cheating. Um, so autonomy is, uh, I want to do more for myself, I want to have more control, or influence over, over my projects or the direction of those projects. For mastery, it's what can I learn? Who can I learn from? I know at this company I'll be surrounded by um, people that are working on this tool and I'd really like to grow in that skill set. Um, I'd like to have a different pace of development and then purpose. Um, am I a part of something bigger? Uh, am I contributing to something that I believe in? So these are questions that you can ask yourself when thinking about why would I want to work for this company and how do I answer that question? Even if the answer, the main motivator is, gosh, I just really, I really need a job. <laughs> and you can, you can say that in a craft way too. I, I was laid off um, and I'm really motivated to work at this company because it's, I can learn X, Y, and Z. I would have, um, influence over this project 
and it's something that I believe is important in society. Another way that um, this is framed as a framework is your head, your heart, and your wallet. So it's not a bad thing to be concerned about your financial well-being. We all are. Um, but it's important to be inclusive in how you speak about it. So your head is your intellectual challenge and your growth. Um, your heart, you want to make a impact in something that's important to you. And of course, um, I care about my own financial well-being and, and this job has great, um, has a great overall package. So those are ways that you can think about answering some of those questions that would of course be unique to you and your situation. All right, um, and lastly, recruiters and hiring managers should ask you a variation of these two questions. Is there anything else that I should know about you? And do you have any questions for me? Um, think of, before going into an interview, think of the one thing always one or two things that you want to make sure that that person knows about you they might not ask and so you have to make sure that you provide that information and find time in the interview to do so um, and then do you have any questions for me this is where you show that you've done research on on the company um, saying nope i'm good um, even though you might have done the research it shows it comes off as um, as potentially a, a lack of interest, even though that might not be true. And so it's really important to make sure that you go in with a strategy to your interview of the information you want to make sure comes across. And before I end, um, it's also important the way that you answer your questions in terms of the timing. Um, one thing that I typically recommend is to have a timer, like an egg timer, a stopwatch in the peripheral so that you can see how long you've been talking. Keep it to a minute. And then that way you can just, you can directly answer a recruiter's question. Is there anything else I should know about you? Um, and then you can pause at that one minute mark and you can ask, um, was that sufficient or would you like me to elaborate? And many times they either want you to elaborate, they have a follow-up question, or, um, or that was enough and they want to move on to the, to the next phase. So that's an important thing is to stop after a minute, take a breath. Was that sufficient or should I elaborate? All right. Um, before we jump into the last part of this, I'll pause. And, um, and here's a reminder of my email if you have any questions. And um, I'll also pause just for a moment before going over that Google Doc for, for any live questions. All right, do we have any questions from the audience? You can type those into the chat box. Or if you'd like to stay anonymous, you can email or text chat Laura Blyle directly. And then here we go. Sophie, I actually had a question for you. So with these virtual interviews that are happening more and more these days, since we can't really go out, um, I, I feel like feedback and nonverbal um, cues during the interview, especially if you're running too long or something, will give you a lot of feedback. Can you still, do you, are you still able to do the same thing through um, a video chat? Because it, I do feel like in general, even though people are paying attention, they tend to not look at the camera as much. Like right now I'm on a different screen, so uh, my video is off, but um, typically when my video is on, I, and looking at this screen so it looks like I'm not looking at you but yeah. do you know what I mean so is there do you have any tips on how to read other people during an interview that's virtual if you can not use a monitor 
while um, while doing an interview so that you're mimicking as much um, eye to eye contact as possible. I think that ooh, um, I, that's one way. Um, I'm learning that as as much as everyone else is as we're going more and more to virtual interviews, but um, but I think that just making sure to have your clear internet connection and then if it's not jumping onto the phone um, being able to switch a medium if that's if it's becoming too distracting and um, and then again just making sure to have your um, your eyes forward in a in the least amount of distractions possible um, that wasn't the best answer but it's something that I'm learning as well as um, as more and more becomes virtual Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, we actually. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, he's just asking if there are resume editors or services that you would recommend. Yeah, um, I link to them in this uh, in this Google Doc. So let's let's jump there if that works. I will share my screen again and briefly go over this Google Doc, and then please just email me if. If you have more questions, can you see my screen with this Google Doc here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when thinking about this presentation, I just wanted to leave you all with um, with a concrete worksheet that you would just have all of the resources. Um, what, there's a, um, a table of contents here that's hyperlinked so you can jump to any section. But one thing that I didn't go over earlier was the Champaign-Urbana companies that are hiring. So here you'll see your Welcome CU, Research Park, Job Board, and then um, MC is a data aggregation site or company service that, um, that has also aggregated companies that are currently hiring. And these aren't companies that have had something posted for over 100 days. These are actively hiring companies in the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, and then it's important to note too, so like these last three companies on this list, Mastery, Volition, and Cloudflare, those are companies that wouldn't show up on any list um, that are three companies that are hiring in Champaign-Urbana, where it's important when, um, when you're driving around Champaign-Urbana, looking at company signs, and then a quick Google of their career site if they're hiring, um, because those as sometimes candidates don't do the best job of telling their story, neither do companies. And, um, and, and making sure that they're searchable and findable. Um, so that's really important in this job search uh, during a, a tougher time for the talent market. And then, um, and then there's a list of national companies, a list of job boards. Um, venture capitalists are a really great way to get a broad scope of, um, of their company portfolio companies hiring and there's many that specifically specialize in a given industry so if you are um if you're in a certain type of manufacturing or agriculture or, or retail or biomedical there's venture capitalists that specialize specifically in those that will have portfolio companies and all of their job openings on their websites um, in terms of resume reviews and um, in terms of resume reviews and email editors, top resume is great. Um, I actually did not link to that in here. Um, top resume is great. And then LinkedIn has some free ones. Um, and then there's, if you actually open up your LinkedIn, you can get bids from um, many different companies and recruiters that will do it for you. So if you upgrade to LinkedIn Premium, which is thirty to fifty dollars, um, you might be able to get a free version of it as well. You can actually ask for bids on someone that will run your resume through an ATS screener, update your resume um, as well, give you a cover letter template, and um, optimize your LinkedIn profile. And so that is, that's an effective way to get bids that way, which is relatively new. Um, and then you can ask 
um, individual recruiters as well um, for for that service. But, Go ahead. Yeah, but this is um, this is not all inclusive, but I just hope that it's a, a resource with links that can get you started and seeing that there are definitely companies that are hiring, um, even though it, it seems, it could seem like um, the news is filtrated by layoffs. So hopefully that's in, in your job search. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions. The first is from Monique. Should you contact the hiring manager or recruiter if the job post says, do not send us any emails about your application? No, <laughs> if that's the case, then don't, no. If they specifically put that on there, um, then they're used to getting contacted and, and it's just not part of their workflow. So I would respect anything that's specifically on the, um, on the job description. Okay, and then the last question is, uh, may I ask what happens when your applications are shortlisted? What can you expect after that? What does that mean to be shortlisted? Uh, I don't know. Let me see. What Jenny, is that a question that was submitted or? Yes, that was. question asker that was actually submitted to Laura directly oh, okay um, I, I guess I can guess what that means um, what does it mean when the question is what does it mean when your application is shortlisted what happens when your applications are shortlisted and what can you expect after that so I guess it's once you know that you're into the group that is moving forward so once you've gotten past the the screening oh brock has it one of the yeah one of the final round applicants let's see here yeah i just looked it up it just says and you've passed the initial phase of screening <laughs> um I, I think it really depends on the company and their interview process overall um if shortlisted means that you've gotten past the screening part there's a um most companies follow a general template there's the application review, which is the um, which is where you would be screened out potentially by an applicant tracking system. There's then typically a recruitment phone interview. There's the hiring manager phone interview, an on-site interview, um, and then maybe one follow-up. But generally, every company would follow this interview template. And so depending on where you're shortlisted, you should get the information in terms of what should I expect for the interview process. And if you haven't gotten it, you can absolutely ask the recruiter your point of contact for that information of, I'd really like to prepare as well as possible. Can you please let me know what the interview timeline is from here and who I'll be speaking with? If you haven't gotten that information, it's more than acceptable to ask for it. Okay. I hope that's helpful. Um, if, if this person wants to email me directly about their specific scenario, happy to, happy to discuss that as well. You're muted, Jenny. Yep. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Sophie, for all of this great information. Um, we will be, this was recorded, so we will have this uploaded to our YouTube channel by the end of the day. And we will send out uh, the slides and all the links along with the uh, link to the video to everyone that registered and attended today. So thanks again. Have a Thank good day. You.